Are we ready? Badger fans, the, the game is a day away. I am stoked. This is going to be a really fun show. We're going to talk about what you need to look for in this game so we don't overreact or underreact. And then we're going to get into some user comments, including somebody who doesn't really think I know what I'm doing here. So I'm excited for it. I love it. Game day. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, my friends? I am Ryan Herrings, your host of Locked On Badgers. Thank you so much for making this one of your first listens every single day. We are here to cover your team every day. And if you're finding us on YouTube, thank you so much. If you're finding us on the pod, if you're listening to us in the car, thank you so much. It is always humbling to, to share this um, this time with anybody. So thank you so much. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, our friends at Bet Online. Uh, has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before? Bet online where the game starts, and let's get into it. Right, it is game week. Right, do you feel that that little bit of adrenaline, that little hit of dopamine? It is um, by the time you're listening to this, a day away, if not the day of. I am stoked. I'm excited. I already got my my pregame stuff set up. What I'm gonna do, where I'm gonna watch it, what I'm gonna eat. I am ready to go. As a reminder, we're gonna go live after the game, so join in on the therapy session. Really appreciate to have you all there. And I'm going to start. This is going to be a fun show. Like I said, a lot. The, the last two segments of this show are going to be your comments from the last um, several YouTube shows. So I want to get into it. Always want to bring your thoughts into the show. I think it's really important, you know, to build this community to get as many voices as possible into it. Uh, but segment one, I want to talk about something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, I want to talk about because obviously Illinois State is a is not a suitable matchup for the Badgers, right? So what do we actually take out of this game? Right. As you're watching it and the Badgers average, you know, 6.5 yards per carry. What what are we actually taking? Is that good? Does it matter? Like if it's, you know, five, five yards per carry, is that actually uh, kind of a, a scary sign because Illinois State's not very good? There's a couple of things I want to talk about that I think regardless of the opponent, regardless of who we're playing, I think we can really take a look at and draw out. And then I'm going to look at a couple of things that I don't think we're going to get a good feel for. Okay. So the first one I think is really important. I, I mentioned this on the Mer Is Mertz Ready show, but we, I think we can get start to get a feel for how Bobby Ingram in the first quarter, in the first half, while this game is still something of a game, I think we can get a feel for what he's looking at, what him and Paul Christ are looking at for run-pass balance, right? And, you know, if we come out and we – the first drive, really important. This is going to be really interesting to see. And I bet you if we win the toss, we're getting the ball first. I can promise you that. I – Side note, I hate that Paul Chris always used to take the ball first. I, I am a get the ball at halftime guy. I think you can, it's the only way you can get two possessions back to back without forcing a turnover. Uh, I think, you know, smart coaches really can game plan around that. Chris has never really been that dude. And I get it. He's an offensive guy. He wants to get on the field. But recently, the last couple of years, he shifted that a little bit. If you notice, he's been taking the ball more at halftime. So in this game, if we win the toss, we're getting the ball 100%. He is taking that ball. He may bribe the official to win the toss to get the ball first. And I'm totally cool with that in this game. Let's get the offense out there. Let's get Mertz out there. Like, let's let Bobby Ingram get into a rhythm. So, yeah, if we get the ball first and that first drive is like seven runs and two passes, listen, you can, it's going to be frustrating. And I think that's something where we can take a few things out of this game in terms of. Are they going to try? Are they going to strive for more of a run pass balance? Right. And I think they need to. I and I've talked about it. In these games where you overmatch an opponent, you really have to let your passing game, which has been the, the biggest thing holding this entire team back, you have to let them find some stable footing. You can't just turn to them on third and seven in Columbus and say, All right, your turn now. You got to throw. I think you have to build those reps right now. And we're going to see that in the first quarter, the second quarter. You know, I don't think as much the second half because the game's going to be out of reach. I'm I'm not asking for, certainly I don't think most people are asking for Mertz to be out there slinging it around if we're up 28 in the third. But that first half is important. I think, I think we can glean stuff out of the play calling in the first half in regards to how they want to structure the offense this year. So let's keep an eye on that. Um, here's the other one that I think is really important, and I think we can really take something tangible out of this game. Again, this is a bad team, but I was – I've said this before on the show. I went to a coaching clinic uh, when I was coaching basketball. I, in another life, I was a basketball coach. And I went to this clinic, and um, they were doing Q&A at the end. And it's a really good clinic. Bob, Bob Knight was there. Jay Wright was there. 
Uh, there's a lot of really, really good uh, college coaches there. And, you know, this, this high school coach raised his hand. It was in a question and answer session. And he said, coach, when is it too early or too late to react? In other words, you know, should you re overreact to if your first two games are poor in the college basketball season, do you need to start changing up what you're doing or is that too early? And that the coach at the time speaking, I forget who it was, but he said something that always stuck with me. He said, you should always react. Just be careful not to overreact. And that sounds like a very obvious thing, but I, I make that point because a lot of people with this game, with this Illinois state game, will just say it's too early to react to anything. No, I think you can take stuff out of this. I think we have to react to what we see, and there's actual things we can get out of this. And the second one is, like I said, run pass balance, how they're going to structure the offense. Here's the second one that I think is really important, and we can really take something out of this game. Is the offense sloppy, right? So you got to remember, there. and by sloppy, I mean, are we getting false start penalties, uh, you know, motion penalties? You know, are we getting delay of games, having to take a timeout on second and three because the play clock's done? Is Graham Mertz trying to figure out signals coming from the sidelines? Like it's those type of things that if it's sloppy in this game, it's not going to get fixed in a week. Right. And the reason this is important is think about all the new coaches on the offensive side, right? You have a new running backs coach. You have a new offensive line coach, a new tight ends coach, a new offensive coordinator. And he's also the new quarterbacks coach who is also a new guy calling plays. Right. You also have two new tackles. You have uh, multitudes of new receivers, Jake Ferguson is gone. There is a lot of shifting around on the offense, um, way more than we were used to with the consistency that Paul Chris has always had. It's really important in this game just to see the offense line up, to see the offense execute, to see the offense not get two or three delayed game penalties, to, to be able to preserve tight end our timeouts for when you need it, to be able to run some of the concepts they're trying to run, right? To look crisp, not to, to not have to throw the ball into the dirt because the screen pass doesn't develop. And those aren't givens. I, I like a lot of these these moves we made in the offseason from the coaching standpoint. I've talked about. It. I love Bobby Ingram, right? I I love Bob Bostead moving over. I, you know, I yeah, some of the other hires I'm a little iffy on, but the point remains whether you love them or not, there is a gelling period. And I'm very curious to see if the coaching staff is past that gelling period. And if they're not, week two is not a gimme, right? Washington State with that Cam Ward quarterback is not a gimme, everybody. So I think those are the two things offensively from a game planning standpoint we can tangibly take out of a game, even against an overmatched opponent. Let's look at run pass balance and let's look at how sloppy or clean the offense is. I think it's going to be a great sign if they come out, they execute, not a lot of penalties, no false starts, that kind of stuff. So really excited about that. See how that plays out. I also said we're going to talk about one thing you're not going to be able to take away from this. I don't think you're going to get a great gauge on the offensive line or on the defense line, quite frankly. I think the Badgers are just going to, no, quite. They're, they're just a lot better in the trenches than Illinois State. You know, a four and seven um, Missouri Valley Conference team last year. So there may be really gaudy running protection in this game. There may be incredible pockets for Mertz. You know, there may be no time for Zach Anikstead, the Illinois State quarterback. I don't think we're going to get a great feel on the offensive and defensive lines and just how good they are. Um, maybe in week two, a little bit against Washington State, but we might not really know until Ohio State with that group. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I won't take a ton out of that, but anyway, coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about your comments, your thoughts. If you're a listener of the show, if you leave comments, I'm going to bring as much of it as I can into the show today. We're going to talk about it, chop it up, because again, this is a community show. We're building the community, and um, you know, I want to make sure your voices get in there. So that's coming up next on Locked on Badgers. You're not going to want to miss it, especially uh, I get some flack from somebody. You're not going to want to miss that. So that's coming up next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, today's show is brought to you by the National Highway Transport Safety Administration. Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen, right? You end up driving below the speed limit. It's funny. It's not funny. It's not a big deal. It's, it's a big deal, right? It's definitely a big deal. The truth is your reaction times are slow when you're when you're too high. They get slow. They get slower and slower the higher you get. Um, you not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind a wheel. Do not take the chance. Do not risk you know, the multitude of things that could happen. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high and get a DUI. All right, everybody. I want to thank you again for making Lockdown Badgers one of your first listens every single day. Um, again, I am just – the community is growing. Remember, though, 
please, if you can, support the show. If, if you hit the subscribe, it's a big way to support us. We're trying to catch Michigan State, who still has quite a few more subscribers than us. And I know they're not a better fan base. Let's build this community. Let's catch up to Sparty. Um, and we're getting there. We really are. Also, as a reminder, after the game, um, if you're on the Discord that we have, I'll put that in the show notes as well. We're doing our first free giveaway of the season. It's a James White autographed rookie card. Just a way to say thank you. Um, there's no strings attached, no shipping fees. I send it to you. Uh, and just a way to say thanks, like I said. So that's going to come up after the show if you're on our Discord. All right, let's get into it. So I really wanted to, like I said, bring user user comments into the show. And I'm not going to get to all of them. And I, I do apologize for that. I read every single comment that comes through the channel. I try to respond to most of them. Um, and I do try to do these shows occasionally to get your thoughts up here. So let's get into it. Um, the first group is from the the last show we did. You know, where we're, we're just kind of talking about uh, quarterback recruiting, John Garcia. And the first comment I'm going to read, Big Apple Bucky and Tom Nesis also has a similar thought. And they said, considering the current dearth of quarterback talent at Wisconsin, recruiting two kids in 2023 makes a good deal of sense. So they both, both Big Apple Bucky and Tom Nesis, thank you for the show. And I agree, my friends. Yeah, I, I thought, again, not to be the dead horse, but... There's no more important position in football than quarterback. Thank you, Captain Obvious, right? So it's also by far the weakest position on this team, both from returning starter production and the depth chart. I I, I don't understand the reticence to recruit two quarterbacks. And quite frankly, I thought last cycle they should have brought in, you know, Miles Burkett and a transfer. There's just not enough depth. There wasn't enough quality depth when Chase Wolf was healthy. So I, I completely agree with this. And I've seen this comment elsewhere. I there's no reason not to take two quarterbacks. Now, if, if you can't get him, you can't get him, but you should be trying to get two, right? And a lot of fans, and I understand this point, will say, well, you know, quarterbacks don't want to be part of a two-quarterback room. Or if you get one, then you pick up another one, the first guy might transfer. Listen, not, too bad. I mean, that that's where I come down on that one. Like, it, if a quarterback is going to transfer – as soon as you bring in another body, they're probably not the type of dog you want as your number one quarterback anyway, right? If you're bringing a transfer, someone had mentioned the offseason. Well, if you're bringing a transfer, maybe Graham Mertz will leave. First of all, Graham Mertz isn't going to leave just because you bring in a transfer. He's going to compete. If there's one thing we know about Mertz, he believes in himself. But, and I'm not saying I want him to, but but if he were to transfer, he's probably not the dude you want anyway, right? Like you want players who embrace competition. Look at the offensive line. Look at the outside linebackers. TJ Bowlers, right? Um, you know, guys like that, TJ's Bowlers, I'm trying to think of the other one that's slipping my head right now. Oh, uh, Caden Johnson, both four-star kids. Both said, we knew there would be competition here. I mean, they're fighting to be in the two deep. You know, the offensive line, Nolan Rucci is a five-star guy. Logan Brown's a five-star guy. They're, they're being beat out by better competition. Competition is always better. So I would shy away from the thought that you can't get too many quarterbacks because then they'll all transfer. The bad ones will transfer. The, the competitors and the good ones will stay. So... Yeah, 100% agree on that comment. I probably beat that one to death, but I would absolutely take two quarterbacks this cycle if you find two good ones. Um, Chris Newman talks a little bit about the empty student section. He says, how much does an empty student section at game time and beyond, as well as the empty seats in the stadium, mean for recruiting visits? Nebraska's always sold out. Iowa's always sold out. The student section has got to be an embarrassment for the coaches and impossible to hide. Yeah. I mean, I... This one's been beat to death too. And we already saw Wisconsin football kind of come out with a comment that said, hey, please get there on time, right, to the students. And it's just one of those things. Now, night games are always a little better. You know, the the afternoon starts are always a little better. But those 11 a.m. starts are just killers. And at the end of the day, the students just aren't going to show up. I know there's been a bunch of talk about the policy to get in. The stadium hasn't been very good. You know, it needs to be more streamlined, easier for students to get in. But I don't know. In the big scheme, I don't know from a recruit standpoint if that's the biggest aspect, but it I think it probably definitely sticks out in their head, right? It's definitely something unusual when you compare that when they also take a visit to Nebraska or you know a, a Michigan State or an Iowa where they're not seeing that gigantic swath of empty uh, empty seats into the second quarter. I would say this: um, I think recruits choose a school for a myriad of reasons, right? A, a hundred reasons, and uh, even though it's a major eyesore. Chris, and I appreciate the comment. I think it's probably pretty low on a recruit's um, priority list when they're more than they're picking that school. Uh, appreciate the comment, of course. Logan Thorpe, I just love this, man. He said, hey, I love listening to this in the clinic every day. Logan, my friend, thank you so much. Uh, whatever clinic you're in, I'm sure you're doing amazing work. Um, so thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad you're, you enjoy the show and you listen to it. Um, thank you so much. 
Alien Space, who's been with us, I think one of the first people to ever leave a comment on the YouTube channel, Alien Space. He wanted to point out Ashton Sanders did get a crystal ball to Wisconsin, could be the next commit in the 2023 class. So, yeah, Evan Flood, a 247, the great Evan Flood, a very, very good um, recruiting insider. He crystal balled Ashton Sanders to Wisconsin. Ashton Sanders, if you remember, uh, defensive tackle, defensive end. He could play both, hybrid player out of California. He came to Madison, loved it, uh, had great vibes on Twitter, loved cheese curds, and I, I really thought we had him. And then he went to a Cal visit, uh, ended up committing to Cal. Well, he recently, um, within the last two weeks or so, decommitted from Cal, reopened up his recruitment, and then it sounds like he reached back out to Wisconsin. So uh, seeing a crystal ball there is a good thing. Ashton Sanders is a really good defensive line prospect. Um, a lot of versatility. You know, like we, we've we really, like we've recruited the defense line recently. He could play inside, outside. He slimmed down for a senior season. Um, I saw a post that said he lost about 20 pounds. So, yeah, Ashton would be more than welcome. Um, you can never really have enough defense alignment. So that was definitely good to see. Deborah Brown, who has listened to a couple shows, really appreciate the comments, Deborah. Uh, Wisconsin has a lot riding on this year from a quarterback recruiting standpoint. The more modern quarterback wants to play for a team that has a modern offense. I hope Bobby Ingram makes a positive impression on these recruits. These three quarterbacks sound very promising. So multiple things are, I want to break it up. So make sure we can hit all of it. Um, your first point, Wisconsin has a lot riding on this year from a quarterback recruiting standpoint. Yeah, 100% agree. 100% agree. Maybe more than they have in a long time. Because we you have Graham Mertz you know, coming in junior year this year. Even if he knocks out of the park, he's got one more year left. And then we have a bunch of question marks behind him. Now, I like Miles Burkett. I like the intangibles. I like the, the leadership qualities. I like the mobility. I like Deacon Hill's arm, right? So there's parts of those two players we like, but there are massive holes and question marks on that depth chart. So, Deborah, totally agree with you. This is a massive year for quarterback recruiting. Um, your next point was the modern quarterback wants to play for a team that has a modern offense. I hope Bobby Ingram makes a positive impression on these recruits. Yeah, I mean, I think we've we've seen it a little bit in this cycle. A couple of quarterbacks, uh, Dorman, and I'm trying to remember the other one, but there are a couple of quarterbacks who, who who kind of made some comments about not sure if they wanted to play in Wisconsin system, right? Not a hasn't been that quarterback friendly recently. And so to your to your point, yeah, I think quarterbacks want to play in a system that's friendly to them. And your last point about these three quarterbacks sounding very promising. You're talking about um, Kaminsky, the in-state kid, Jerry Kaminsky, uh, Ryan Brown, and and Cole. I, I agree. I like all of them. Now, I, they all bring something a little different to the table, but a class with one of those and maybe another player, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty high on that. Um, Deborah, thank you for the comment. I really do appreciate it. Kevin Wills, who's also had a lot of comments on our show, um, someone I really appreciate hearing from. So this is in response to our secondary show when Justin and I talked about the defensive backfield. He said, got it. Our good to hear Wohler's a freak athlete plus a thumper, which we've missed since Pearson wasn't allowed to play. Yes. Reggie Pearson, oh, if people forget about how good he looked, he should be an all Big Ten safety for us right now. Well, I shouldn't say he should be. Like Wisconsin medically won't clear him, and I'm not going to ever say uh, anything wrong with that, right? They're, they put the they put his safety first. They thought something was there. They shouldn't clear him. It is what it is. He went to Texas Tech. But that dude's a baller, and he would have had a really fun career in Madison. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, Wohler is kind of uh, the next up in that in that vein. Um, he also asked if there's any word on Blaylock's return. I haven't heard anything. If he plans on taking another year, certainly Travion Blaylock missing the year of the season could take a medical, uh, could come back next year. I don't know. We'll have to see. It, it probably somewhat depends on his rehab and how it goes. Um, I don't know. Would love to have him back though. He's a, he's a big time athlete. All right, let's do a couple more comments. Actually, let's take a quick break and we'll come back. We have another five or six comments to bang through. Uh, really enjoy getting your stuff on the show, everybody. Uh, we're going to keep doing a bunch of this as much as we can. A uh, bunch more comments from y'all coming up after this break on Locked On Badgers. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Locked On Badgers, making it one of your first listens every day. It is game week. It is game day almost, and we're here for it. Like I said, I wanted to wrap up this week with just comments from the community, from y'all, because that's what this is about. So for everyone who left a comment, thank you. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. For the ones I couldn't get to, I apologize. There are way more than I can get to on a show. Um, and it, don't don't take that as a slight or anything like that. I just I picked a, a group of comments from the last couple shows. So if you didn't get in here, keep commenting. I promise you I read them all. And I need to do a better job of getting up there, which I will. Uh, let's keep moving on. So Sound Sailor, again, talking about the uh, secondary discussion that Justin and I had, the secondary show. 
I know there's a ton of talent and excitement around Waller, but I'm a little worried about him being ready this year. Still really high on the defense at the end of the day because we have Jay, we have Jim Leonard and the other team doesn't. Yeah, I mean, that last part's true, right? At the end of the day, we know for sure probably in every single game, I mean, maybe barring Iowa, uh, but probably in every single game, we have the advantage at defensive coordinator, right? And that's a big deal. It's It's like having an extra chess piece on the board that other teams don't have like we have an extra rook or an extra knight um so yeah it's having jim leonard's awesome i totally agree um sound sailor that's a great point but your your other point about Waller is dead on you know everyone's excited about him but what if he's not quite ready and that's something justin and i talked about when i said worst case for the secondary it's not impossible to think that the safeties might have a bit of a growing pain here with with Waller in his first year and torchio really his first year as the full-time guy at free safety. You know, keep in mind, Torchio's played a lot of ball at Wisconsin, but he's played it mostly behind Nelson, or he's played it mostly in a nickel situation, right? Or he's played it mostly in, he just, he has never been that number one true starter. So yeah, him and Waller both, I could see some some mishaps there. So definitely uh, Waller's worth being excited about, but yeah, I, I agree with your point. It could be a situation where it's just a little too early for him, which is nice that we have three kind of get-off games, right? Um, although Washington State, maybe we shouldn't say it, but we have t- at least two games early in the year with New Mexico and Illinois State where mistakes aren't going to kill us. We can learn from the mistakes. The young players can learn from the mistakes. So I uh, really appreciate the comment, man. Um, next up, Lee Hershale. And again, if I mispronounce any of these names, I am sorry. Uh, he or Lee her lash. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, he said, excited about our defensive backfield. Agreed. I am as well. Uh, first three games will be critical to the DBs to come together prior to Ohio State. I believe we are more athletic than we have in years. A solid pass rush will be critical. Go Bucky. Indeed, go Bucky. Lee, man, thank you so much for the comment. Also excited about our defensive backfield. Justin agrees with you when I had him on the show talking about the most athletic defensive backfield we've had in a long time. I think that's true. Um, you know, we've had some some great athletes back there, you know, the Natural Jamersons, the Desmond Southwards, Tanner McAvoy, uh, you know, but as a whole, there are athletes everywhere in the secondary and there's some really good athletes in the two deep. So yeah, I agree. Um, interesting point. Uh, you know, you talk about the first three games being critical with this secondary coming together prior to Ohio state. I would say the first game's critical come together for Washington state, right? Washington state's going to spread us out. And we'll have to see the if the hype around their quarterback is real. But Cam Ward is getting a lot of hype as a potential NFL dude. If they spread us out, you know, Cam Ward starts chucking around, that's going to be a test for the secondary right now. So I would say Illinois State itself is, is good to get ready for Washington State. And then, yeah, you need all those games to get ready for Ohio State. So totally agree. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for the comment. Um, then we're going to go to the, the Mertz show. I did a show, Is Graham Mertz Ready? And uh, Rich Walsh said... <laughs> I love this, by the way. I chuckled when I read this. Uh, Rich Wall said, I strongly question your analysis. As far as I'm concerned, you are not realistic in your outlook. I suggest you study college football history since you have so many things backwards. Rich, my man, I, I'm I'm wrong all the time. Like, uh, So, no, I appreciate the comment. I really do. I'm here for all the discourse. You know, I, I will not just read the good comments. I'm here for all of it. So I, I just wish you had more details there. Like, I don't. I, when you say I have so many things backwards, I wish you would tell me where I'm wrong and then we could chop it up. Come on the show, chop it up. I am here for all of it, man. Um, we're trying to build a community that we can go back and forth and we can disagree. And um, I'm wrong a lot. You know, I'm a firm believer. And if you're never wrong, you know, you're never really, you know, you're, you're kind of just involved in group things. So I will put myself out on some ledges and some limbs um, and I get some stuff wrong. Absolutely. So but I, I just, I'm not sure which wrong thing you're pointing to. <laughs> so um, I do appreciate the comment, Rich. Uh, if you want to, you know, keep believing the comments, let me know where I'm wrong. And if you want to jump on the show, we'll chop it up. I, I like I said, I, I like the, I like the sauce. I like the heat. So um, no, I appreciate the comment, Rich. And hopefully I, I get a little, I get a little better going forward. Uh, John Kopemeyer. And again, man, if I get these names wrong, I apologize. Um, John said, I would like to see more in or more just go for the juggler from Chris. And I, I included this comment for a reason, right? So he said, I missed the Bielema teams that hung 62 points on someone, never let off the gas. Those teams were aggressive, creative. James White throwing a touchdown pass to Monte Ball, Ball throwing a completion to Russell, Russell Wilson. 
You know, it's really interesting because those are really Paul Christ offensive coordinator days. But if you remember, we did a show um, where I, I talked about, you know, does Paul Chris need or did Paul Chris kind of need Bielema a little bit? Does he need kind of an aggressive guy to poke him with a stick? Because these, these aggressive, unique, creative plays you're talking about, that was Paul Chris calling those plays. But we don't really see it as Paul with Paul Chris, the head coach, right? It's weird. And it, it was kind of the comment we made about, you know, Bielema, as much as he's derided a little bit uh, among Wisconsin fans, I think was in, in some ways, right, I think was kind of good for Chris. I think his kind of bully mentality, his kind of arrogance, you know, good and bad, by the way, um, I think that kind of rubbed off on Chris a little bit in those games. And I, he played, he called it, excuse me, Chris called the games not so close to the vest. And it's int- it'll be interesting to see what happens this year with Bobby Ingram and Chris. We have no idea. But I wanted to include that comment for a reason because I agree. And I think it was an element of, you know, Bielema helped unlock some of Chris' aggressiveness to some degree. Um, two more comments really quick. Uh, Greg Lincecum. You know, the key is don't beat yourself. Don't put your defense in a bad spot. That's normally the winning formula for us against most teams. Unfortunately, you must be more aggressive against the better teams. You can't just turn it on and off. Practice aggressiveness against teams you should beat easily. More room for error, but bigger upside. Go for it. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Greg, man, thank you so much for the comment. You are echoing everything I'm saying. You don't have to be aggressive to beat Illinois State, but you're going to have to be aggressive to beat Ohio State, and you can't turn it on and off. Right. It doesn't mean you have to take the same level of aggressiveness, but you do have to. You can't just throw 13 times and then against a good team when you need to throw it 28, expect it to turn on. So, Greg, yes, thank you for the comment. I 100% agree, brother. Um, really do appreciate it. Last comment for the day. And again, I apologize for all the ones I couldn't get to. I do read every single one of them. Uh, BW Graphics. I hope for ISU and New Mexico State, Mertz proves himself in the first half and the second can be split between Deacon and Miles. As much as Mertz needs passing reps, so do the young guys. Uh, yeah, 100%. Uh, I think we should see in tomorrow's game or today's game, whenever you listen to this show, you know, if we're not seeing an extensive amount of Miles Burkett or Deacon Hill in the second half, something has gone terribly wrong, right? And the same for New Mexico State. If we're not seeing an abundance of the backup quarterbacks in those games, then this season is going to go off the rails, right? Because we should plaster those teams. I mean, like, you know, the old Roman times when they just roll over countries, you know, that type of, of just take into the woodshed, uh, no survivors should be those two games. So we should see uh, a ton of reps from the backups. Um, totally agree with you, BW. Thank you for the comments. And that's about it, everybody. We're going to wrap it up. I hope everyone has an incredible game day. I hope everyone has a great time. We're looking forward to it. So enjoy it while it's here, right? Uh, we wait all off season for this and we're here for it together. Uh, as a reminder, we're going to go live after the game, so I invite everyone to come on. I'm going to try to uh, send the invite for the show out as well, right? So everyone, people can actually, if you have a webcam and you want to jump on the show, you're able to jump on. I'm, I want to get maximum interaction for the therapy sessions after shows, so we're going to try it. We're going to see how it goes. And with that, man, um, on Wisconsin, I'll talk to you all soon. Happy game day. I hope it's an amazing time for you and yours, and let's get it.